All I have is Christ. He's all we need. And it's good to hear that today. It's good to sing that today on Christmas when there's so much distraction, right? Well, our, our reading today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot with the tramping warrior in the battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. Psalm 25, verses 4 to 5. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. We thank you for the dawn of this new day. A day we celebrate the light of the world. Your son given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, a sermon title today, a little bit different than maybe the normal Christmas titles, right? A new day has dawned. A new day has dawned. Maybe you hoped for more of a sunny day today, uh, but here it is. The light has arisen and with a bit of rain as well, but that's okay. We're, we're nice and cozy in here today. Get to wear the jacket, only bring it out on special occasions. My wife said it looked a little Willy Wonka. So... Um, Sorry, I distract. The lesson today, we don't have an outline as such, right? But I have a sentence that I want to use as we go through our passage. And it's this. A new day has dawned in the sun, and because of who he is, we can live in the light. I'll say it again. A new day has dawned in the sun, and because of who he is, we can live in the light. All right, so let's get rolling here. I've got an illustration. Back when I was a kid, I had this, this string of nightmares happen to me as a child. They often re revolved, um, I won't get into details because there are kids, but, but I would wake up in a, in a sweat, in a terror, and I'd be in the pitch black dark of my room, and I would try to find the exit. Maybe you've had this experience too. And you're worked up, you're, you're fearful, and you're just clamoring, trying to find the way out of the darkness, out of the room. But the knob of my closet door was the same as my bedroom door. And I would often find myself going to that doorknob, opening up and going in there. And like a child, maybe you too had your parents store their clothing in your closet. So my mother had these big long dresses and robes in there. And I would be there in the dark and I would be floundering amongst all this clothing, trying to find my way out. And eventually I would get out of that scenario and I would find the actual door and I'd race on down to my parents and be calmed down and uh, find my rescue, right? 
But I was stumbling in the darkness. Stumbling in the darkness. And that is the reality of many. Not just in a literal sense in that way, but in a spiritual sense in our day. And it's also what we find in the passage, the context of this passage that we're looking at today. God's people were stumbling in the darkness. If you've got your Bibles open, I encourage you to to be there with me. But we just flip back to chapter 8, verses 16 to 22, and we hear this. Verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal the teaching among my disciples. This is Isaiah the prophet. I will wait for the Lord, who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel for the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the teaching and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. God's people were in darkness. There was no dawn. They were stumbling. Doom and gloom. This prophet is right. He's, pro- pro- he's putting forth to the people a doom and gloom scenario here. You see, if you do not have the truth, I love it how he puts it. Go to the truth and the testimony, right? To the teaching, to the testimony, verse 20. Earlier, verse 16, bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. Isaiah is a man committed to God and God's word, God's law. But here we have God's people looking elsewhere, looking to mediums, looking to dead to answer their prayers. And that is not uncommon in our day either for people to look in those avenues. New age is rife here. Just go down to the hills where I live, just walk the streets, you see some strange things. If you don't have the truth to light your path, you don't have the right information. You're not getting true reality. You need the light switch to go on so you can find your way to the exit. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word given to us gives us the light for us to take the next step. Each day, that's just what you need. Just enough light, just enough truth, enough information about reality before you so you can then walk in it. That's what a Christian is to do. But if people are looking in other avenues, they're stumbling in the darkness. Well, God's people, Israel, at that time, needed to get back to trusting the truth. Well, given our our passage, there's really just two ways to live in this passage. There's the the humble who walk in the light, and there's the the stumblers who walk in the dark. God's people then and God's people now desperately need the light. Now, in that era, in that time, there was a king, Ahaz, and he was... ruling and reigning at that time. It was a dark period in the history of the nation of Israel. But as we get to our passage today, verse 1, there's hope. And we're about to enter into this great passage, one that in the, new, in the Bible you know, could be up there with John chapter 1 or you know, other verses in Isaiah. You know, it's just one of these beautiful passages of Scripture. There's hope. There's a but. Verse 1, it says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Nepetali. But at the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, 
the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Now, there was a specific word for the people then, but there, there's also, for all of us, a general word here. There is hope that Isaiah foretells. God's people might be in dark days then, and they might be in dark days now, but there is a glorious way. You see, there was one who came to that area, Galilee, and he did ministry there. He was called the prophet of Galilee at times, wasn't he? So we start our sentence. A new day has dawned. A new day has dawned. A new day breaks into the darkness. And so verse 1, we, we know that the Assyrians moved in in time. But Jesus, after his testing in the wilderness, would begin his ministry in that very area. And he did, in fact, make it glorious like the, uh, the prophet foretold. And we know this because Matthew's gospel, Matthew uses the, the, these verses from the passage of Isaiah. It says, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 to 16, Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people were dwelling in darkness, have seen a great light. For those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Then verse 2 of our passage, Isaiah 9, 2, describes this. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. God's people may be in deep darkness, but a light has shone. What can we know about this light? Verse 3, there will be an impact. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with the joy at the harvest. And they are glad when you divide the spoil. This is going to fulfill what Genesis 12, we heard about this yesterday, the Abrahamic blessing, right? Where God was to bless Abraham to be a blessing. Here we see in this prophecy, this being forecast, a blessing to the nations, an increase of joy and rejoicing for the nations. And aren't we evidence of that coming true? Here we are, many nations represented in our pews. It has gone out. Isaiah 9, 4 to 5, for the yoke of his burden and the staff of, for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. That's a reference back to Gideon and his, his battle and win. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in the blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. This one who is to come is a victor. He's a champion. He wins. The prophecy is made, but it's as good as done. There's no comparison, no competition, no challenge. The son is a warrior. Now you notice in, in those verses 4 to 5, there's, there's these, um, these fours. So for the yoke of his burden, then for every boot, and there's an even greater for in verse 6. For to us, a child is born. And so we continue to build our sentence. A new day has dawned in the sun. And so we're finding out about this son here in verse 6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulder. The light has shined in the darkness through the gift of a son. Unto us a child is born. Well, that speaks of Jesus' humility and his humanity. And just as we heard earlier in that Philippians reading, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The one who would come would come in humanity and with humility. And then 
unto us a son is given. Well, this speaks of Jesus' deity. That means his godness. He's God in human form, both truly God and truly man. It makes him truly unique. No one else could get this done. Needed to fulfill both those requirements. He is the one and the only son of God. He is given to us. For the nations to be blessed, remember Abraham, there had to be the fulfillment of that promise. And Abraham had his only son. Here we have God's only son given for us. Like John 3, 16, his only son to love the world so that the world wouldn't perish, but would believe in him and have everlasting life. And then the government shall be on his shoulder. Well, this is a different kind of politics. This is about someone who would rule and reign in righteousness. This would be the true king, the ultimate ruler. And probably Israel, we're looking for a different kind of king, a fierce warrior who would, would win physical battles. But no, this king came to rule in a different way. Well, both in the child, we see the humanity, we see a son of divinity, and we see one who can truly govern. We have a righteous ruler. James Montgomery Boyce says, for us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. This verse teaches that the Messiah was to be one who was always God's son, but who would become a man at a particular point in history. Hence, a child he is born, but a son he is given. These verses are rich. Now, perhaps you're looking at our passage today and go, where's the word Jesus come into this? It's not there, but have no doubt this is about Jesus and history confirms it. Well, an unopened gift. Many people and many people this Christmas will leave a gift under the tree, so to speak. Have you ever done that just by mistake? You, one got tucked behind? Well, Jesus is the gift like we just read. He's the ultimate gift. So many people are just looking at small stuff, playing around with material possessions. Jesus is the ultimate gift. But many will leave that wrapped up and they won't even know the blessing and impact he can have on their life. They're just really into the celebration, but it's a celebration of self. Now, last year around this time, my wife Anne and I, we went around to a, a, an apartment complex to pick up a bookshelf that we'd organized with a seller on Facebook Marketplace. What could go wrong, right? Anyway, we, it, it went pretty smoothly, the transaction, but I remember going to this place and going up the stairwell and thinking, how am I going to get this bookcase down? But I was greeted by this little eight-year-old boy, and he was so bubbly and interested in who we were and what we'd come to do, and he was just exuding uh, friendliness and wanting to engage with us. It was a Pleasant surprise. We had a little bit of banter and interaction. And I remember as we made the deal about the bookcase, I said to him, oh, you're looking forward to Christmas? Because this was about this time last year. And, and he looked at me kind of baffled. And the mother at that point entered in, cut off the conversation and said, oh, we don't celebrate Christmas. And I just went, like, something in me just sunk. Like, I'm like, He's this eight-year-old boy. He needs toys. He needs a feast. He needs all the trimmings of Christmas, right? He needs to be blessed like many of us will be today. But no, he knew nothing of that. How sad. Not even a secular Christmas for this lad. I mean, obviously, we want people to know Jesus Christ and the true meaning of Christmas. But this boy, it seemed, didn't even have a hope of stumbling across that truth. And I just remember thinking, could I sneak back and give him a gift somehow? But no, I, that would have caused problems, I imagine. But isn't that the reality for many? Even those who are all about the, the carols by candlelight and all the, all the secular Christmas stuff, they miss the true gift. 
They miss the son that's given. They leave him wrapped up. All right, well, we continue to build our sentence. A new day has dawned in the son because of who he is. And we learn about who he is here. Verses, verses 6, And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's break that down. He's a wonderful counselor. His name is wonderful because he himself is wonderful and also because of the work which he accomplished. He is called counselor because he comes to us as the revealer of the Father's will. That's Ironside who made that comment. Now, a counselor is someone who, who makes wise plans, who gives information, who reveals the truth to us. Jesus is the one who does that in a most brilliant and wonderful way beyond just mere humans with his counseling. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 29. This, is also, this also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is, a wonderful, he is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. And then a New Testament reference from Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. In whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus is a wonderful counselor. He is also a mighty God. It's one thing to have the plan, but then have the, the capability to, in, to implement that plan. And Jesus does that for his people. On behalf of his people, he has the strength. He is omnipotent God. He is all-powerful. He executes the plan. He is also our everlasting Father. You might think on just face value here, isn't he the son? We just heard that. He's the son. Why is he being called the everlasting father? Well, he still in, has these qualities of being a protector, being a provider for his people. He is benevolent. An ideal king will look after his people. And Jesus is, is like that. He is an everlasting father. Jesus is our everlasting Father, provider, and protector. What else, what else is he? He is the Prince of Peace. Well, we often read that on, a, on a, a sign or a card at Christmas time, peace. It's just thrown around. But Jesus is the source of true peace. Jesus reigns as a prince. And he'll one day be king of kings. We read in John that he talks about being a person of peace. He says this to his disciples, John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus gives eternal peace by his death on the cross. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Well, it says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He gives peace. The issue between an unrighteous and unholy, a sinful people and a holy God is that Jesus provides a way. He provides the peace. R.C. Sproul says, We have an advocate with the Father. We have a mediator who keeps peace. He rules over the peace because he is both the prince of peace. He is our peace. Well, there you go. There's those great four names that we hear so often. We hear it in the, in the great Handel's Messiah song, don't we? Well, what is, it, what is the result of all that's been said about this Jesus? Well, verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. There will be a reign. There will be an increase of peace. The righteous ruler, the great God, the Jesus who has come, he will do it. 
and it will be forever. So let's finish our sentence. A new day has dawned in the sun because of who he is. We can live in the light. We can live in the light, folks. It's a dreary day, but it's a great day. There's a lot to enjoy today. And it's because the sun has risen. John 8, verse 12, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There's an old song called In the Light. The words go, I keep trying to find a life on my own apart from you. I'm the king of excuses. I've got one for every selfish thing I do. What's going on inside of me? I despise my own behavior. This only serves to confirm my suspicions that I'm still a man in need of a savior. I want to be in the light as you are in the light. I want to shine like the stars in the heavens. Oh, the Lord to be my light and to be my salvation. Because all I want is to be in the light. All I want is to be in the light. Is that you today? Do you want to live in the light? The sun has shone. The darkness has been broken. It's a new day that's dawned. But do you want to live in this light? That's why Christ has come. Well, back when I was that kid stumbling around in the darkness, I needed the light. And in my life, God has been gracious to me to show me that way. I hope that's true for you too. Jesus is the light. He provides a way of escape from spiritual darkness, from our sin and our rebellion. He saves us from ourself, from that person that just wants to celebrate self. That's what that mother at that at, with the Facebook marketplace deal said to me, oh, we just do a celebration of self. That's darkness, folks. And that has a dire outcome, a dire ending, when it's just about you. There's a true king. His name is Jesus. And he will save the people from his sins. He is the light of the world. There will never be a greater light. It will never be extinguished. What are you waiting for? John the Baptist, he said, is this the one or should I wait for another? This is the one. Jesus really is the light of the world. Walk in his light, live in his life. This is the day there has been a dawn. The light is breaking the darkness. You don't want to miss it. Zechariah says it best, Luke 1, 7, 78 to 79, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. A new day has dawned in the sun and because of who he is, we can live in the light. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has made his light to shine upon us. Great faithful God, your mercies are new at the dawn of this day. Your light has graced us and you are truly a gift if we are to open it through faith. Lord, grant many people this Christmas the gift of your Son so they may rejoice in the light that he gives because of who he is. Lord, help us to receive you this day and then to rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Amen.